Michael Kugelman is Senior Program Associate for South and Southeast Asia for the Wilson Center's Asia Program. He joins us for this edition of NOW. Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here with you. So uh, December will mark, uh, we've already seen the 13th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan. And in mm -hmm. December 13th, I believe, yep. is the day where the troop drawdown reaches its conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does this mean for the future of Afghanistan? Well, I mean, most but not all foreign troops are going to be leaving, and I think that's important. Uh, there is going to be a residual presence of about 10,000 uh, U.S. troops, and uh, this means that Afghanistan will get a psychological boost. The Afghan security forces, which are very fragile, um, will know that they're not being abandoned, so that's good. But I think it's important to keep in mind that nonetheless, these 10,000 troops that are going to remain next year are not going to be able to stabilize Afghanistan. They're not going to have a combat role. They're really going to be meant for to advise and train Afghan security forces and to engage in limited counter-terror operations. That's not uh, a mandate for stabilizing the country. I mean, we couldn't, 100,000 troops, foreign troops, couldn't stabilize Afghanistan. So it's important to keep these things in perspective. And, and about the, those Afghan security forces, how would you characterize their current status? How capable are they? They're a lot more capable now than they were uh, 10 years ago, that's for sure, uh, particularly in terms of tactical operations, the ability to achieve victories on the battlefield, that has improved. But still in a lot of other areas, from intel collection, uh, air transport, um, there there's still a lot of challenges. And really on a very basic level, I think that the biggest concern is that you have still widespread illiteracy within the ranks of the military. Um, drug abuse is still considerable. And also uh, desertions. A lot of soldiers have just deserted. They've left. Uh, and the numbers are very high, um, very high. And it, it's, it's really troubling. And, you know, it's there that you have to start. That's, that's the basic problem. Yeah. You, those are huge problems that you mm -hmm. just described. Uh, shifting to uh, regional focus, how is the Taliban sanctuaries in Pakistan perceived? How much tension does that create between Afghanistan and Pakistan? Well, a lot, because Afghanistan has long believed that Pakistan has essentially given the uh, Taliban uh, the opportunity to base themselves uh, in Pakistan and to use Pakistani territory. Is there a as basis a for that? that oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there is. Uh, in the tribal areas of Pakistan, particularly North Waziristan, for a number of years, the Afghan Taliban and allies like the Haqqani Network, um, which attack Afghans, they attack Americans in Afghanistan, they've been able to, to be based there for, uh, for, for quite some time. And Pakistan did launch a, an offensive, a military offensive, in North Waziristan in recent months, but it really did not go after those specific groups. It did not go after the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani network. Why is that? Well, it's very simple that uh, the Pakistani uh, state and really the, the security establishment, the intelligence uh, community, sees groups like the Afghan Taliban and uh, Haqqani Network as assets because these groups try to reduce the influence or minimize the influence and presence of India, Pakistan's arch enemy, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. It's really a very simple matter. Uh, on official levels, Pakistan denies that this is the case, but there's pretty clear evidence uh, that this has been the case for a number of years. So not a, a close partnership, but, but more a convenient uh, added bonus of, and when they look at their relationships with India. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and you wrote in the Wall Street Journal piece that you just published that uh, India-Pakistan relations could plunge into crisis. Describe that scenario. Well, I think the biggest fear is that there have been a lot of uh, militants fighting in Afghanistan uh, outside of the Taliban and the Haqqani network that we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. But groups like Lashkar-e-Taiba, which have traditionally been uh, India-focused, Lashkar-e-Taiba is the militant group that committed the Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2008. Fighters from that group have been fighting uh, foreign forces in Afghanistan, but with foreign forces leaving, uh, groups like Lashkar-e-Taiba are going to be looking, you know, they're, they're going to lose one target because foreign troops are leaving. They're going to be looking to return to India, and I think that's going to happen. They're going to try to uh, relaunch uh, campaigns of terrorism in Kashmir and in India on the whole. And I think in India now, there's a relatively new government led by Narendra Modi that is seen as much more conservative and hawkish uh, when it comes to Pakistan. And I think India would not, will not stand or sit quietly um, if there were to be these, these attacks coming so from Prime Pakistan. So Prime Minister Modi would hold Pakistan accountable? Yeah, I think he would. I'm not saying that they're going to go to war, Pakistan mm -hmm. and India, but certainly he would not sit quietly. And I think retaliatory measures, to some extent, could, could happen under these types of circumstances. And uh, uh, looking ahead, uh, the chaos in Iraq becomes sort of a, a, a litmus test or a, a starting point for understanding what might happen in Afghanistan. But mm -hmm. 
But you think there is some good news that these aren't one-to-one -one equivalent situations in Afghanistan and Iraq? Yeah, I mean, this is a very fashionable comparison these days to say, well, Iraq fell apart when U.S. troops left. I'm sure that that'll happen in Afghanistan as well. Not necessarily for various reasons. One being that the, uh, the state of affairs, the general state of affairs in Afghanistan is much more stable than it was in Iraq when U.S. troops were withdrawing. I mean, Iraq back in 2011, even 2010, as you may recall, um, you know, was undergoing a lot of the tremendous violence uh, building up, uh, very sectarian heavy policies being uh, driven by the government at the time, and a lot of bad, nasty things were happening. Now in Afghanistan, certainly, it's, it's a major work in progress. Violence is a big problem. There's an insurgency. But civil rights have increased. Democratization has intensified. Um, the economy has improved. Uh, it's, it's not in good shape now, but it has improved. So there's that baseline, which I think is, is a good thing. And secondly, um, Iraq has these horribly violent divisions, these sectarian divisions. In Afghanistan, you don't have that. You have ethnic divisions, but they're not as sharp, in my view, and, and not as violent as they are in Iraq. And I think that could work to Afghanistan's advantage. Well, I'm going to take that hopeful note as a good opportunity for us to thank you for joining us and also invite you back when uh, things progress after the, the troop uh, drawdown. And we'll see where we stand at that point. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks. Michael. Thank you.